Our next speaker, who I'm glad, I think is really glad that he's following on from that amazing talk, is uh, Justin Sleesman. So Justin is the head of Stanford. Uh, he has been around in volunteering in various aspects of AMSEC. He actually is the uh, the link between AMSEC and ELSA as well. Um, but I think his proudest moment is now walking onto this stage at the Santa Bell Symposium. <laughs> Good morning, and you know, thank you for sticking around on this Saturday. I am Justin Sleesman, uh, profusionist at Stanford Medicine Children's Health. And first off, I'd like to say thank you to the San Bell Symposium Conference Planning Committee. And Richard, thank you for having me uh, at the conference here. It's my first time. So I'm going to be following up using that theme of foundations. I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes or so speaking about a project that was really born out of COVID. And Richard said I was the profusion liaison through AMSEC to ELSO for about five years. Uh, I'm currently now on the board of directors for AMSEC, but this project was born out of COVID during my time period uh, assisting ELSO. I have no disclosures. Now to start this out, I would like to kind of step back a little bit. So I don't want to talk about the project yet. I want to talk about product availability in the ECMO space and cardiopulmonary bypass is fine too, because I think it's something that we all faced over the last five years and the challenges that we uh, came through in COVID. So this is very, I think, a common theme. I've got four patients on life support and only two auctioneers on the shelf with no ETA from central supply, right? I think that I got into perfusion because my favorite show when I was a kiddo was MacGyver. It was this gentleman who could take, you know, simple things and create a solution to a complex task. And I think we do this very commonly in perfusion as ECMO specialists and perfusionists to figure out solutions to maybe situations that are not ideal. But what happens when you have nothing on the shelf, right? And you move to that air traffic controller that I'm sweating bullets. I got to tell the surgeon, the intensivist, that there's nothing available. What do you mean nothing's available? Nothing's coming in. We're working the best we can do. We're looking at sub products. This is something that we did all throughout COVID and we're probably doing now too with our cardiopulmonary bypass products. And that is a challenge that we sometimes face, but it's not anything new. And it's something that we're definitely going to be facing now into the future. But how do we deal with those hurdles and those obstacles? This is just one situation back in, of course, 2018, where our single site veno venous catheter, the origin catheter, went off the market in 2018, right? And we came up with novel approaches in neonatal populations. I'm a peds perfusion, so I think a lot about neonates and peds. And then we were doing two site ECMO, VV, in patients, and that wasn't sometimes ideal. So we applied a lot of VA ECMO to patients that probably didn't require or need VA ECMO, they'd be better suited for VV. Industry catches up, we get the Avalon. Industry catches up, we get the MC3, and we're kind of back to where we were. So the point is that we're always going to have programmatic adaptability to product availability in our careers. Even stepping more and looking at this from a 30,000 foot view of why don't we get supplies on our shelves when we need them in a timely manner. Going back in COVID, we all received a letter, the majority received a letter about uh, not getting the fibers to put in these auctioneers, right? And so typically it's a raw material shortages issue and not really the industry that you're asking, say, McKay, Spectrum, uh, Gatinga, uh, Medtronic, I need the supply, but they are getting these PMP fibers from a single supplier that was in the past of 3M Membrana, and they weren't able to package the part of polycarbonate housing around these auctioneers. So that's really the biggest challenge in is the origin, the source of can you get those fibers uh, to the products and to the industry partners. Labor shortages, I can say coming through COVID, right? It was hard to find uh, a staff to staff these ECMO pumps. Uh, labor shortages still exist. The rising cost of healthcare, the rising cost of actually developing products and getting them to market, especially in the pediatric space where there's not enough of ECMO cases run to actually invest uh, heavily into that space. So that's a challenge for the pediatric population too, that we're using a lot of adult equipment for the PEDS ECMO. Is it too complex, too lean? Geopolitical relations, and of course, you're going to need some check and balance. I think you need government oversight, of course, whether that's in Europe at the CE mark or the FDA. But is that process again too complex or too lean and getting things to market? So institutionally, though, how do we prepare? I think what do we learn coming out of COVID at Stanford uh, Children's Hospital is I think we became more informed and we became more engaged. We communicated with all of our industry partners and in making sure that we could get supply. If we couldn't get our primary supply, what was the next thing that was back up and available? We also, I'd say, strengthen our communication inside our hospital. Never have we before, uh, Don is here, but we talked a lot with our central supply and just really enhancing those relationships to understand what was in our warehouse, what was coming, what we had on the shelf, and what we could apply for the patients. 
And then I think what we do excel as perfusionists even more so is that we understand the nuances of our current products that we use, our primary products. And then we go out and we engage and we look into the sub products and the differences of those and how they would apply into our program in a safe manner. So when thinking about using a sub product, the first thing of course we're gonna be thinking about is safety. I would love to get that product in. We wanna carry on ECMO, but is this the right thing to do? Is this safe for the patient? Is it safe for the staff? P's program, we usually probably all less than 10 perfusionists in your program. It's easy to train five to 10 perfusionists to use a new oxygenator. But when you have 50, 60 ECMO specialists, how are you going to roll that out and maintain safety if you're getting sub product in? You might need to amend your standards and protocols, of course, and implementation. Are you going to have two specialists, two perfusionists? How are you going to do this if you have sub product that is coming into your institution? Now, if you're a PEDS perfusionist, you probably likely had a situation where with your hospital decided to continue with McKay or Gatenga and the pediatric quadrox or the cardio help system. Uh, we did not. We ended up going to the Nautilus auctionator for a sub product. And this is just really the kind of the situation of an impact of a singular disposable change to the program standards. And going through this in our NICU, we use roller pumps in the NICU. Uh, we had to think about anticoagulation. Was that going to change? Our minimum flow rates, right, through that auctionator, the adult auctionator, and the smallest patients, two kilos, three kilos. Our minimum blood flow rates, our gas excrete change. We weren't adding CO2 as much, but now we're going to have to add CO2 from the start that we found. And then when using the roller pump, we had the smart uh, Nautilus auctionator, which gives you wonderful parameters. And it was great for COVID because you could stand outside the room and see everything if you're on a centrifugal pump. When you're on a roller pump, those numbers will guide you, but they're not going to serve or regu regulate your pump. So we had to communicate to them, like, don't chart those numbers, maintain what you have on your uh, S5 system here. And those are the more important pressure values. So just understanding the limitations and the changes when you bring in a sub product. It's always a two-way street though, I think. They're gonna want, if you're gonna get a sub product in, they're gonna want you to say, okay, how many are you going to be purchasing? Um, because they're not gonna give you one or two, right? They're not just not gonna do that. They need to build it, they need to invest in it, they're gonna send it to you. So you have to think about it institutionally. Is this a Band-Aid? Is this a short-term thing or is this your long-term approach? And maybe when you get a sub product in, you're like, oh my goodness, this is actually improving patient care. This is improving our interaction with the disposables and we wanna stick with this. So you have to think about those things and those solutions. And just always know that industry, they want to get you the product, but you have to be realistic based on all those different things that we just highlighted a few slides ago about the limitations of, of getting product to your shelves. So in summary, before we start talking about the foundations uh, project, I think it's important that you have to know your product and then, and then also know your sub product and where you're going to pivot to. This is just an, uh, an example of institutional transparency that we applied in our ventricular assist devices, which is very helpful, I think, in understanding what's on the shelf, where the patients are, expiration dates. And we share this with a perfusion group. We also share it with our PAC team, too, and our heart failure team. So if they have a, a patient that's coming in, they see, okay, we don't have the Berlin cannulas on the shelf, that we can plan properly for this. So I think in, increasing institutional transparency is very important as well. So now we'll get into the project that I was working on uh, with many wonderful people at ELSO. And if you want, you can pull this up on your phone. It's a platform that's available, supplies.elso.org, um, but it was Foundations of a Life Support Equipment Exchange platform. So why did we do this? And I think, I hate to take us back to COVID, but in COVID, it was a different mindset. There was a lot of, I think, anxiety of what we were doing uh, in the hospitals. We're going to be seeing the surge in ECMO. Do we have enough equipment available? And so why were we doing this? We wanted to, uh, to create this out of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation deficiency during COVID-19. And we want to support ECLS institutions when all other avenues are exhausted. And I think that's the important thing here. It wasn't to circumnavigate industry. It wasn't to do anything other than to help the patients out. When these hospitals were truly in dire need, if you're sweating there like that guy in an airplane, you have nothing available, you have no other options, you can't transport the patient out. And this could have been a tool for those hospitals in need. So how are we gonna do this? First off, I needed to establish a team. I think we've heard about how we have probably our regional relationships or kind of our primary relationships. So I was gonna start there. And then I was gonna re refine the platform as I go with ELSA leadership. And then who, who would be involved in this? You need to vet this, of course. You can't just be sending products around to different hospitals. Like Dave was saying to maybe a hospital that is a cowboy and doesn't have standards in it and has a 95% uh, failure rate. So 
It would be ELSO Center as we start it regionally, nationally, and grow, grow it globally. Back to this letter again. This is where it all started for me, really, in February 2020, of receiving this letter to say, you know, nothing's coming on your shelf. There is a gridlock in the fibers themselves that are being manufactured in Europe from 3M and Brana, and you might, not, you might need to start thinking about uh, other auctionators. And I think at that time, there was also a loosening of restrictions, if I can take you back, of using CPB auctionators uh, into the ECMO arena, and that was loosened by the FDA. So things were shifting, things were happening. <laughs> Also, I think what's important too is not to put the, Dave again, I'll say, he said, put the carriage before the horse. And so even though we were feeling this bit of stress at Stanford, we weren't seeing a lot, and we're peds. The adult side was seeing more patients on ECMO, but we weren't seeing a massive surge in patients going on, but we were, we were wondering, is this what people are feeling too with product availability throughout the world? And so we sent out a survey to look at frequency and actually numbers of programs affected by product unavailability frequency of depleted stock affecting patient care, uh, patient population challenges. Was there a specific kind of, was it the pediatric uh, space that was seeing problems with the peds, uh, neonates, or adults? And then we want to look at different geographic uh, regions and locations where the larger academic centers getting their supplies, where the smaller hospitals, maybe a couple hundred miles away from a larger city, were not getting those supplies. So we're looking at those different things. We got response from 230 centers. And it was kind of validating to say, yes, people were concerned at a higher level than ever before that they were having issues trying to get product to their uh, hospital. 37% of pediatric centers said they were having issues and 35% of adult centers said they did too. So that gave me a little bit more ammo to say, okay, let's keep on carrying on with this project. Let's see where this goes. So at that time then I sent out a survey, a smaller survey to 15 hospitals, ECMO centers, ELSO centers on the West Coast. And from that, nine respondents said, we'd love to collaborate. We're kind of having these same issues. And let's go ahead and do this. So I really want to stop and pause and say thank you to Seattle Children's Hospital, University of Washington Medical Center, Swedish in Seattle, Mary Bridge in Tacoma, Dora Becker Children's Hospital in uh, Portland, OHSU Portland, UCSF, Stanford Children's, and Valley Children's in Madera, California. So after that, after we had our, our players in line, our regional kind of centers that we were going to think about how we could send things out, we bit a, did a bit of a war games here where I use Stanford Children's as the supplying hospital to all of these different regions. And just do, doing some of the simplistic things, if we got to a place where we were truly out of product, I wanted to know people's address, who to contact, and we organized all of that through this uh, kind of really mock-up in this draft where we actually send packages to each of the centers to make sure that those lines were available if we needed. I started with Excel. It was got really busy as my initial tracking. And then therefore, I got to a place where I said, this continues to build. It's gonna become a bigger platform most likely or possibly. And of course, I can only go far as the physicians are gonna let me go at your institution, right? That's just, that's it. We can do good deeds. We wanna do good, good deeds for our patients, of course. But I needed the approval from our ECMO director. So I went to Dr. Kate Ryan. I showed it to her and I said, this is what we're working on at ELSO. She's very highly involved at ELSO too. And she says, wonderful, but we're worried about liability, of course. And I said, noted, let me approach that later on in the project. The next thing was to go to Alex Fox, who is the project uh, coordinator and manager at ELSO. And after about a three hour conversation, we really hammered down the flowchart if you're a supplier or a requester and the channels available to each of those supplier requesters. Now, I am a perfusionist. I love being in the OR. I am clinical as can be. I am not a computer scientist. These are computer scientists, research scientists, and I think the best thing about volunteerism, whether it's ELSO, perfusion.com, uh, the Academy, AMSEC, whatever it may be, is the people that you're gonna meet along the way. And these four, Mohammed uh, Narazadeh, Mohammed Rabi, Ula Hujawi, and Abdullah Al Salim are still friends today. And they were instrumental in actually taking what we had built and making it a little bit more formal and definitely more uh, appealing to the eyes on the platform that you see today. So this was our, this is the homepage here if you have it up, is ECMO equipment sharing made easy. Um, and we started with our auctionators because we felt that of course, MacGyvering, that you can put together 
any ECMO circuit, you probably have your hardware. That's not gonna be the limitation. It's gonna be the auctionator. So we're starting with auctionators. And definitely we wanted to have pictures because there's probably a little bit of different interpretation of what auctioneer need if you're looking for your primary stock or your sub product. Now we started with our nine centers. We've actually, this is 15, we've actually grown to 16. Slow growth, it's fine. It's really interesting to build something that you hope never is used. And I can say it's just something built for the future. Is potentially when we went through H1N1, uh, we went through COVID, and what is next? And I think if this was available at the time, I can tell you, I put my personal email on this, and I got some very <coughs> alarming emails from a lot of families wondering about ECMO. Of course, I pointed them towards ELSO, and I could point them towards the map of where these centers are available in their region, but it was alarming to see all the interest in the ECMO. Um, but this is kind of growing organically, slowly, and definitely built for the future. There is a general, if you have questions about the platform itself, I think we answered everything relatively quickly here and efficiently on the frequently asked questions um, if you want to be a requester or a supplier. We also added in tutorials, uh, just one to two minute videos to simplify the process to show you exactly how everything works, that diagram that Alex and I created, uh, a lot of those videos uh, that helped explain that as well. And then I think we, it was more importantly too, is we had to embed some type of shipping mechanism here. It had to be embedded in the platform and we had to be able to track everything. And so we created this and that you could actually see if I was a requesting hospital and I sent this out to all the hospitals that are the suppliers, that everyone could see it and I could see who grabbed onto that. So then I could carry on that communication one-on-one -on -one with our hospital and that was covered. And so we have a tracking system within the platform uh, that does so. Then lastly, we use FedEx, and of course, hopefully if anyone's using this, it better be overnight because this is absolutely dire need or even that day. And of course, the cost of this should be going to the requesting hospital. Um, it is a small amount, of course, but it definitely shouldn't be the supplier of doing the good deed and getting punished for that financially. So it's easy as putting this label on your package and saying to the hospital for which you've already had that relationship and the address and the contact through ELSO to send it to. And out of all of this, of course, liability. What if I send a product that is, gets cracked or it's not their primary stock, they use a sub product at their hospital, they put it in and it causes harm to the patient. Now is that liability on that supplying hospital or is it on the requesting one? And this documentation through ELSO's legal was very important to one, protect all the hospitals that would be engaged in this and protect ELSO as the moderator too. So the MOU was to communicate the mutually accepted expectations between requester and supplier and protect ELSO as the moderator. So that's embedded in there in a legal sense. The user agreement, there's a pop-up document at a time of registration and there's a two-step verification. Again, you can't just be any center out there. It has to be an ELSO center, a bit of a relationship of course, and an ELSO and a number with ELSO. You can see here, this is just a simple form of if you were looking to join as a requester or a supplier and you wanted to register your site, that you just need your name uh, and email, your center name, and also your ELSO center number, which can be found on their website. Again, you'll have to click on the user agreement, but more importantly above this, as this is built out over time, who knows where this goes? I really don't know. Um, but I think what's important is we build it out that we're always taking a snapshot of the current times that we're in and the product availability and the, the things that we're facing. So if you have any comments about this, we'd love to hear it uh, and definitely refine and evolve this platform uh, as it, as it uh, moves along. Here's the user agreement. But right now in its current status, everyone always asks me, is it getting used? I had multiple calls from different government officials as we were putting this together, which was quite alarming. They're like, are you using it? Do you see the need? And I said, I see the need, but we're not using it. Hospitals are doing okay. But they would check in with me every month or so during the height of COVID, and it was very interesting. And I would never push this, and I don't think any hospital should ever push this. We shouldn't go around the industry. We shouldn't do anything other than what your hospital is doing. But it's definitely there in the situations of maybe we need to send a product to a regional area at a high density of ECMO for some reason, or if a pandemic uh, should come back in the near future. So at this point, it's just in the United States that we're growing it. Now we have 16 centers. We'd like to take it globally, but at that time, we'd have to go back to basics, of course, and think about logistics and shipping and whatnot and CE marks. 
And we need center, center verification for those hospitals as well. So the culmination of this was, you know, creating this paper in JET. And I would say that, you know, it was, it's a phenomenal project because ECMO truly is multidisciplinary approach, right? Perfusions are highly involved. At our institution, perfusion is highly involved in ECMO. But it was wonderful to work with different positions throughout the country and to work with all these wonderful perfusions that made this happen. Now to give Ray Wong a little bit of props here uh, on JET. I think it was, you know, I, I spent a lot of time on this project. Uh, again, I hope it never goes anywhere, but it's available for the future. And what was interesting is that you kind of have these moments you're like, well, it doesn't matter. And maybe it doesn't matter, and that's just fine too. Hopefully you never use it. But I think there is, you know, there's a lot of eyes on this project. There's a lot of interest in this because we saw that the download rate, which was the most downloaded uh, uh, article inject in 2023 with 7,000 downloads, that there seems to be a potential need or at least some questions that might arise from this project itself. So I think creating a pathway for product availability in your hospital, whether it's supplies at LSO.org, or just maintaining what you have and improving your current stock and your relationships with industry and getting the products that you need is always going to be either. either. Um, FDA approval of equipment is always going to be challenging, especially in the pediatric space of getting the proper products that we need. Uh, I think this is my personal opinion, but I think it's important to diversify your products. Don't kind of go pigeonholed into one company because if you can't get that one company's products, and a lot of these companies though, they're going out and actually starting to create their own fibers, their own warehouses, and I think that'll be an improvement. But make sure you hedge a little bit so you have some options to uh, provide the best care for your patients. And lastly, uh, ELSO resources. There are wonderful tools on the ELSO homepage here, one being the exchange platform if it's ever need to be used. Um, but the other one that I would like to highlight is the, uh, the equipment updates here. And it's a good resource if you wanna know what's going on in the ECMO space, if there's any limitations, FDA, CE problems going on. And there's also a fantastic committee on WhatsApp. There is WhatsApp for neonatal, peds, adult, VV respiratory and adults, and it's very active. And the problem that you're facing in ECMO, I can tell you all of us are facing it too. And if you're looking for a solution, Giles Peak is constantly on there. Uh, usually a solution is had there on that WhatsApp group. So I highly recommend you take a look. So I don't know what the future holds, but what I can say is I think through our efforts uh, with ELSO2 is that I think we're better prepared for whatever the future holds as far as ECMO support and getting product availability on the shelves and then having backup options uh, with supplies.elso.org. Thank you. Yeah, do you want to get all the uh, speakers up, please? Um, open up the floor to questions. There's a load of things coming in at the moment online, so I will try and read those out. I mean, thanks again, guys. I mean, that was that was a really good session. Um, flowed very nicely into what we were, we we're all uh, very interested in and in where we go. Well, we get some thoughts and comments from the, the, the uh, audience. I mean, online, there was a couple of things. Dave, we'll start off with you. There was, um, could you... Or would you find a AI withdrawal algorithm useful, or would you suspect that actually that'd be very dangerous and go down a slippery slope? That's a that's a really good question. Um, so the problem is, is everybody's been doing this long enough, is that you'll see a hundred patients, and ninety nine of them you'll say this patient's not going to live, this patient's going, and then you get the one patient that survives that you just didn't expect. And I had one of those in my career, so it's really hard to say with certainty that um, I don't think anybody would ever trust a black box telling them this patient is definitely going to die. You know, so you can use it as a guide, um, but when it comes right down to it, I don't think our surgeons are ever gonna trust 100% the information coming out of the mystery black box. So uh, withdrawal, you know, we all have our touchy feelies about that, but uh, I don't think AI is gonna help us too much with that. Yeah, I think that was a comment that was made quite a lot during the talk as a case of, is it just gonna replace what we do? Um, and of course it, it's not, it's, it's there to assist, not to take over. Um, you can never lose that, um, that, that human touch because that, that's the, the ultimate thing. So at the end of the day, you've got a child's life at the end of it or the animal's life, whatever. Um, so just thinking then about what you made, you made a comment about being at a small center which had a 95% mortality rate. Come to you, Tavern, in, in which case, should you make this also, you know, program of training mandatory? 
because there's, there's obviously uh, an issue that things are being done to not say off label but certainly by people that have not got the right training and that's why you have such poor outcomes so is there a way that we could you know say that our social actually almost say if you do ECMO you have to have had this training I think um, that's certainly something that you know that we've thought about almost you know in the sense that if you you know are working in a hospital that your pals trained your ACLS trained so that you're ready to take care of those sick patients having some kind of a certification like that so that you're you know prepared to take care of um, your certain pa patient population on ECMO I think is is kind of what we hope for the future um, with this course that anyone who's going to be taking care of a patient on ECMO will have done this training and and have the certification so that we can overall standardize ECMO education and hopefully prevent um, you know or at least improve our ECMO care worldwide for neonates and pediatrics and hopefully prevent um, you know further um, complications that could be prevented yeah brilliant any questions okay oh, If you guys have option for exchanging expensive cannulas like Avalon or Protex, could you say the one question one more time, sir? Is there is there an option for exchanging expensive cannulas like Avalon or Protex, like right before they expire? No, that's that's not Elso's mission on the exchange. It's not to offset financial burden. It's to help the patients, and so. I got a lot of emails from families, but I, got, I get a lot of emails from hospitals asking, hey, I've got the Avalon, I've got the MC3, I got this auctionator, can I move it from hospital to hospital? And that is, that's not the mission of this exchange platform. It's really to help patients, I think, and not offset financial burden. Um, where I could see it be used, though, in the future is if those people want to donate to maybe mission trips or whatnot, then that's probably something that there's complexity in there, but I see that as maybe a potential avenue or offshoot of this. Thank you. One of the other comments I saw on that line was the course that the Quadrox uh, has been removed or isn't there available. How has that affected you know, the, the idea of having all these different items that you could then exchange if you've suddenly got one, the one particular one that's gone out of the market completely? Sure, yeah. For the, the pediatric quadrox or the yeah, HLS yeah. sets? Uh, pediatric quadrox. Pediatric quadrox, um, not available right now, of course. So you're, you know, you're looking for your sub product and what's available in Euro sets and and Nautilus and whatnot. And so when that comes back to the market, of course, it'd be available back on the exchange. Um, but I'd be, I'm curious here is who is still using and for pediatric and neonates who's using the HLS set still for for ECMO at their programs? Just curious. And that's, you know, the interpretation of the letters that you receive from industry and FDA, right, are conflicting. And it's hard to get really the true source of what's going on, I think, and when it's going to become available again. And the interpretation of what was wrong in the first place of sterility and packaging and what that means to your program. And, you know, that's really at the eyes of the beholder, too. So in Stanford, we took them out of our, our practice. We took those disposables out and we're using the Nautilus. But on the adult side, they just carried on and they kept on going because that was their bread and butter ECMO circuit. So it's definitely an interpretation. Um, but when the pediatric quadrox auctioneer comes back independently in its own set, um, yeah, it would probably go back into our program and it definitely would be available on the exchange. Luke, Hi, Luke Burs, uh, Iowa City. Um, thank you all three for very nice presentations. Um, um, my, I had a remark for uh, David, I looked up uh, the quantum dots, and they won the chemistry Nobel Prize in 23. And to, to show how the AI works, I started QUA, and it already showed quantum dots uh, Nobel Prize. So it heard it's listening. <laughs> and I have a question for Justin. Uh, great work. Congratulations. It, it's, it's a hard work, and, and we don't applaud it uh, enough. Um, do you see clusters of centers uh, popping up in other countries or continents? Or is this just the USA? I know ELSO is international, but... Again, it has not been used, right? That's the interesting thing. And so we have to see where it goes. And we, it's interesting to build something, and it's ready. We have to wait for some 
terrible thing to happen where you might have a surgeon ECMO. Now, a lot of those people that were involved in the, in the program, they were going over and speaking at meetings in Europe and the like. Um, it's not available or we're not going to make it available in, in Europe or globally yet. But of course, ELSO is a massive global brand. Uh, they're in over 900 centers. So if it did have a importance to get to a region globally, then I think it should be built for that as well. But right now it's not. There's things with shipping too, and of course, limitations in trade um, and specific regions that might not allow this platform too that ELSO was talking about. So that's, it sounds wonderful until you get into a project and then working through the details is extremely challenging. So not quite yet. Uh, Hamid Darwin with Midwestern University program in Phoenix. About 11 years ago, I had to transport a patient on a quadrox from Saudi Arabia to Hershey Medical Center. And I was sitting at the edge of my seat because we had to stop by in Germany, get uh, refueled, and then come to Boston. And I was afraid if change of elevation is going to affect my membrane oxygenation, but likely. We were okay and we got the patient to the Hershey Medical Center and they continue on with his treatment. So it was possible. Just Coming back to the uh, ideas we're talking about in terms of, you said that, you said it's not used yet. Is there anything worldwide to show that there was a surge anywhere in, you know, pediatric ECMO at least, that you could then just think back to what um, Dave's comments is that actually once you start giving that data, you can then start to see where the uh, disease process goes. You can then use the AI to then think, well, actually, we need to stop putting more items in to stop, much like the, the Amazon warehouse idea. Yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting concept. Um, and um, it'd be amazing to kind of put those two things together and have, um, you know, like you said, almost like the Amazon warehouse idea where, um, where there's already an algorithm predicting kind of how much equipment that particular facility uses and and when it's likely that they're going to need more of that equipment and have that ready for them to prevent centers from, you know, from not having the equipment that they need. Um, so really interesting concept. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that too about if that be a possibility in the future. It's the registry. The registry is, is extremely valuable and also, and it's international, right? So it's got a very strong data sets in, in the States, but globally it does as well. And I think that we would be able to track anything globally through the registry it would probably be the best place for that to look at it. And then honestly, these WhatsApp groups are very international. And so if you go on to their homepage, you go to WhatsApp groups, you can find what you're looking for because we're all going through the same problems. And that probably would pinpoint the location of where the issues are. You know, what was interesting is that your foundation was specifically looking for the ECMO and the vast majority of your centers were pediatric centers. So that was a very tight, well-organized group to start with. Um, you know, there's a huge potential to expand that to the adult world or maybe cardiac surgery supplies. Um, everybody in this room has experienced the absolute nightmare of getting supplies from certain some of our vendors over the last, it's going on two years now. Um, I worked at a center where the entire 10 months I was there, we never once had that facility's actual schematic circuit. We were cutting and pasting pieces from other centers that had supplies that, that we didn't get. So, uh, and then we know there's a manipulation by the vendors to send the stuff that they get to their high, you know, their uh, busiest centers. So, um, I think that there's an opportunity to store that stuff. But the biggest thing is, is all of our supplies expire in what, two years, you know? So we would have to get the FDA to say, Hey, let's, you know, under an emergency, maybe we can extend that to three or four years or something. There's just so many pieces of that puzzle. Hi, beautiful talk guys. Uh, Fred Prep, New York. Um, this isn't really a, um, a distribution question. But it's more like a quality control uh, question of a lot of these packs that um, have not been, you know, actually put together properly. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not good at this. <laughs> I'm like that 70%, you know, 20, 70, 10. I on the 70. Um, no, so my issue really is with custom packs and supplying. Have you noticed an increase of 
quality um, assurance issues. With these packs, they're not manufactured properly. And I've had one-way valves put in the wrong way. Um, I mean, there are issues that uh, I think affected a lot of different uh, places, uh, along with this distribution shortage, of, obviously. Is there any correlation? I don't know if there's correlation, but I, I feel that, or I see and feel the same things that you're seeing too, our packs are coming with valves the wrong way. They're different than our standard path that we've had for years. We're actually, Don and I and Tristan, who is here, we're all right now going through and creating new tubing packs and I'm concerned what we're going to get. Um, so I think, you know, you're talking about cardiopulmonary bypass, there's a lot of variability there right now, I think, between the manufacturers and the companies. Um, but yes. <laughs> Hi, Aaron from DC Children's. Um, I was just wondering, do you, for the education um, presentation, who are you, who all are you gearing it towards that needs to be you now become certified? Obviously, we have ECMO specialists and respiratory therapists, but then there's also the doctors, um, you know, the people who are making this, the decisions to put patients on ECMO. Um, because I have a feeling that a large amount of the centers where they do, you know, under 10, the reason the patients didn't survive is because they never should have been put on in the first place, not because of the people that are running the ECMO. Um, I also wonder if we should start including VADs in that education, because we are seeing a larger amount of oxygenators being put into what would be considered a VAD patient. Um, and we don't have anybody to run them because the ECMO specialists are saying this is not ECMO. Perfusion doesn't have time. And so they are basically just being left alone with an oxygenator, a hemoconcentrator, heater cooler. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, great, um, great questions. So the course um, we... Um, have created that to be for anyone taking care of a patient on ECMO. And um, so it, it would be um, something for doctors, surgeons, anyone who would be involved in the care of the patient. Um, in fact, the um, I've just encouraged all of the PICU fellows where I currently work at the University of Florida to take the course. Um, and so, and that was a big reason why we structured it that way in terms of our expert panel uh, being comprised of um, people with all different skill sets um, so that we made sure that we were getting the um, the opinion of multiple different uh, people and who work in multiple different areas in terms of what they thought was the most important thing to be included in the course. So, um, so it would be a course for anyone taking care of a patient on ECMO, um, including the doctors, including anyone involved in the care, and especially to students um, who are who are just learning about, you know, nursing students, medical students any kind of students as well who are who are just learning about those kinds of concepts um, would be for anyone. And that's a great point about um, VADs. We, you know, the course right now, we don't really have anything um, talking about VADs. And, um, and I have seen that, of course, a number of times where the patient is on a VAD and has some, some type of um, pulmonary condition that happens and then they need an oxygenator put into their VAD. And that has been an issue. So a really great point to bring up about including that in the course um, so that um, everyone can feel more comfortable with what is a VAD, what is the management that goes into that, and how do you take care of a patient on a VAD, you know, and what are the differences um, in terms of that so that they can be prepared to take patients on that kind of support as well. So I'll bring that up with the team. That's a great point. Thank you. Can I just ask one quick question when we talk about this? Can we just clarify the nomenclature? Because also there's, there's a lot of comments coming in about once you've got a VAD with an oxygenator, is that not ECMO? It's ECMO. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I so by, I, think, I think that maybe needs by to be definition. Written. Sorry? By, 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 by. Yeah. <laughs> by definition, it's ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. <clears throat> and that's the frustrating thing is that there's just no standardization. You know, we go to, I've seen people write papers on putting an oxygenator in a VAD and calling that ECMO. Technically it's ECMO, but it's a VAD with an oxygenator. You know, instead of 
trying to encompass it in something else that's already been made up. Let's just call what it is, the VAD with an X, it's an LVAD with an X, or an auctioneer, it's an RVAD with an auctioneer. Um, but the problem becomes really confusing because we don't have standardization. We don't have standardization of terminology. We don't have standardization of um, training um, at a specific facility that I'm currently working at. If you put an oxygenator in a centromatic VAD, the ECMO specialists aren't qualified to sit that. But as long as it's not a cardio help, the specialist can sit that. It's the same circuit, different equipment, um, but it, it becomes even more complicated depending on the facility you work at. And that's one of the comments that are coming in is the fact that actually it's the specialists that don't want to train on multiple systems. Um, and they've also, it's, there's a bit of sense of humor going on because somebody says, well, it's ECMO, it's ECMO, and somebody else has done, no, it's a heart lung machine. So we'll, you know, we'll leave that one alone. To your point too, I think it, it has to do with the training, right? We're the same way where some of our, our nurses are just fat trained or some are just ECMO trained and it becomes staffing too, of course, is when an auctioneer gets placed, you have the available staffing. Right now, I think we have five or six PD mag and central mags on that might get an auctioneer and then place, put in line any of those patients that are waiting for transplant. So we feel that same, that same issue too. I have a question. Um, this is actually to Justin. Um, when you were developing this, did you come to the realization or have other people realize that perhaps mobile ECMO development needs to be in place? Um, I just recently left Massachusetts General, but one of the things that they had was an app, and it was actually started by the Boston EMS team for ECPR. And the three main hospitals, four main hospitals participated in it and they sent out an alert, hey, we have a patient coming in, this is the code, who can accept? And Mass General, it's not unusual to run 40, 50 ECMO patients at a time. So during COVID, we did run a lot. My question to you is, is should we be focusing on big centers developing mobile ECMO teams to take from the smaller centers to increase a mortality or de decrease mortality, be increased survivability? And does that offset or offload the staffing issue that you would see at the smaller hospitals so that you don't have a small hospital with 95% mortality? Um, I know at MGH, we would fly out, we would go on ambulances, we'd pick up patients and we'd come in and we had a certain mile radius that included states, Maine, Rhode Island, all that. Um, because they literally just couldn't handle the staffing. So while you're developing this with ELSO, do you see the need for a development with centers? Hey, I can take a patient, I have a 300 mile radius that I can fly, I can come get your patient. Are you seeing something like that? Sure, I'll take that on. I, you know, I think so you're talking about the hub and spoke model. There's a Northeast consortium too that you're talking about that has, it's like 16 centers that are constant communication about the availability of beds and can they ship them from one place to the other and who has equipment and whatnot. I've actually gone and spoke with them. It's a fantastic group. The same thing is done with the University of Washington and Harborview too. They have quite a bit of range and they're always constantly communicating. So these things are in place regionally. That's usually where they start. And I think it could have um, you know, some traction maybe in the WhatsApp group there of Elso. You know, back in the day, um, you know, it seemed to be that we were going out and picking up a lot of ECMO patients and bringing them back to Stanford, whether it was the adult side or the pediatric side. We're doing that a lot less. And I think what's going to be, you know, it's, it's financially incentivized too, that if you keep that patient now, you don't transport them to the academic center where we have 10 patients on ECMO all the time. And so I think that that's okay, as long as they have the proper education, that if we talk to these two here, that you have a center that 95% mortality, they probably shouldn't be putting them on or they put them on too late. Um, and also we need better education too, and wherever that comes from, but probably better education for these, these institutions to kind of get them up to scuff and get them onto a, a level playing field. Uh, so we used to do, you know, at Children's Hospital now, uh, solely, we used to do about 10 transports in a year. Now we probably do two or three. We just did one last week. So it's happening less frequently, and I think that the education is better. And these programs that are going out and doing it, I think we had a kind of a five-year gap here where programs were trying to figure it out, and now these education tools are going to help support those smaller programs. So I don't think it's necessary that they need to go to all the bigger academic centers that can keep them. But we do see, as you're saying, is when the staff is fried and they don't have an ECMO specialist, that's when we're flying out to these hospitals to go pick them up. So you hope that they don't get to that point. 
and be realistic on how long that patient's going to be on ECMO support. Can I just clarify? You did say 40 to 50 ECMOs at one time, didn't you? Yeah. How many beds do you have? Uh, no, no, it's a serious question because we have five ECMOs and it shuts the entire program down. It's probably 3,000 hearts um, a year, just in cabbages, valves, that kind of stuff. And then we probably do another close to 100 lung transplants, or they're aiming for another 100 this year. And those can often end up on ECMO post lung transplant. We do liver transplants. So yeah, I mean, we probably have four floors of ICU alone. Wow. Yeah. So, it's, it's a question that's coming in from the uh, chat as well. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So, I mean, it's a, it's a significant program. Mm. It's, you know, and now we're flying out, and now with the ECPR program, we, um, we're one taking the, on more. Yeah. One of the things that complicates your question of doing regional ECMO is that where it's successful in the UK because they have established government-controlled regional ECMO, we don't have any kind of agreements like that here in the US. And because our medical system is incentivized by money. If you put somebody in on ECMO here, they want to keep the money for putting them on. And now you're sending them to another center and you want them to babysit your ECMO patient that you shouldn't have put on for the next three weeks. They want to get paid too. So then it becomes a, do you have a relationship, a financial relationship between the hospitals? Um, and that's where our hospital systems are really missing the point because now we're thinking, I'd rather make the money than the outcomes of the patients. And until, unfortunately, we start getting some government oversight on that and start tying quality to, uh, to outcomes, um, I don't know how well that's going to work with the gentleman's agreement. I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, yeah, just a remark. Um, with regards to the nomenclature of ECMO, there is absolutely a strong definition and nomenclature of how you should call ECMO. And those articles are freely available on the ELSO website. And if you're really passionate about calling an Alvet with an oxygenator ECMO, I would suggest to read to see if it's in there. Uh, I'm not. I'm, talk, I'm looking at you, Dave, but you know, I just need some a face. And if it's not in there, then write a, a passionate but very kind email to the author and ask to put it in there the next time. Just let me know. Brilliant. Any further questions or comments? I have to say, this has been a fabulous discussion. The, the, the chat online, is, they, they, they say how brilliant this is, and it's nice to get the um, opinions from all different areas. It's been a pleasure to have, having you here, so thank you for joining us. Uh, us. I was mere perfusionists, mere mortals. So I'd like to say thank you very much, and if you would, um, well, come and enjoy some lunch. Thank you.